to the Highway Podcast. And today I've got an old friend of mine who furnished me this weekend with one of his latest publications, the Shanghai School of Street Fighting. If you haven't got it, get it. And if you don't know where to get it, it'll be in the links below. Okay. I'm going to put it out everywhere. Tommy, welcome. How are you Hello. doing? Yeah. So, yeah, you've written another book. And I this is like, and I think you've said it yourself, you know, it's like a brick. I mean, this is like value for money. It's beautifully illustrated. Work. I want to talk about this today, actually, yeah. um, because it's something I think that was definitely needed in in the marketplace, you know, the self-protection marketplace, if you like, because it, it harks back to the, the old ways of doing things, which are often the best, I think. Yeah. You know, people who've been there and actually done it. So I know you've, you've recently moved away from the Midlands, um, uh, all at the beginning of lockdown. And uh, you find yourself down south. Um, and, and what's it like down there? It's all right. Uh, one of the funniest things is uh, I moved down. I started scoping out different gyms. and you know, I'm looking for venues for my club. But also, you know, you know that a box, I'm looking for a boxing gym. Um, found myself a couple of different boxing gyms going there. Everyone that is south of Beaconsfield Services has no idea of accents. So people think I'm South African. Australian, Canadian, not one of them assumed I was British in any way. My accent was so befuddling to the Essex people that I, I, I could have come from Timbuktu. And to go into the oh yeah, Tommy, the, the bull ginger Australian guy, the you know, the, the Canadian Canadian Tommy. Like Canadian Tommy. That sounds right. pretty good actually, doesn't it? Canadian yeah. Tommy. But it, it it really struck me how very few people around here ever go anywhere else because they've got such proximity to London. Uh, wow. You'd think in a massive multicultural centre that they might have met one person north of Watford, but no. Uh, so I'm, I'm enjoying just having a new personality and backstory at every boxing gym I go to. Uh, you can just reinvent yourself wherever you go. Exactly. But you know, sadly, um, the Apocalypse box set season two and three have both struck. And because yeah. I'm down here, this was... This was tier four before tier four was friendly, you know, but before everyone had tier four, uh, uh, this, uh, this was a major kind of, I imagine in another less enlightened age, they would have just napalmed the place. Uh, <laughs> it was so um, but, you know, it's been going good and it allows me time to write and do Zoom seminars and talk to people and relax, go on walks. I could do a lot of my work from home. So for me, Lockdown's actually been pretty good. I've enjoyed it. Um, I've had no crippling illnesses, and it's been fun. Um, not you fun. Can, you can make the most of it, can't you? This is what this is what I've been saying to people who are all doom and gloom. I go, well, you know, turn it on its head. What can you do? Stop talking about what you can't do. Talk about what you can do, and then, you know, learn a new bloody language. Write your book. You know, play a guitar. Learn an instrument. You know, I mean, there's so many things you could be doing now, and you wouldn't have had the time before. Yeah. You know, and people like, you know, from a from a pet's perspective or a child's perspective, it's been the best year ever. They've had they've had more time with their owner or their mom or their dad. Like you would have paid parents would have paid a fortune to have this much time with their kids before. And yeah. again, you know, it's shit for people that have lost people, and that's awful and terrible. Yeah, that's awful. Yeah. Yeah. And it's shit for people whose businesses have been utterly yeah. screwed over by it. So I, I get that. There are there are pros and cons across the whole entire thing. But there are definitely pros to be found if you go looking for them. You know, there's, you, know you, you don't get much chance to train with people. But if you imagine all these premium top level instructors are now opening themselves up, you know, you can you can go to a bloody Zoom seminar with Bob Breen. You never have done that before. You, know, you would have paid hundreds of thousands of pounds to go see all these famous instructors. Now, with a bit of time, bit of effort, you can you can do what you want. Like you said, martial arts stuff or non martial arts stuff. Uh, yep. Both well, you, can, you can reinvent, you can, yeah. I mean, I, I know people when we had the first lockdown, a few friends of mine who are, you know, pretty well-known instructors were sort of whinging a bit about not having the gym open. And, and I said, well, just go online. Oh, it's really complicated. Of course, now they've got their heads around it. It's like, it's the best thing I've ever done. I'm going to keep this going after lockdown. As well as running classes, I'm going to run an online presence as well. You know, and it, it's not actually, the technology is not that difficult. I mean... It's, it's a case of just, it's like I say, what can I do rather than what, what I can't do? You know, the possibilities yeah. are endless. And even, you know, and, and I know 
some people have lost people and, and people have lost their businesses. But even then, you know, a friend of mine, he's basically lost quite a, quite a huge chunk of his business. He, he whinged for about a day to me. And then he just went, the next day he said, I woke up after having a chat. He said, just thought, well, I can't do anything about that. What can I do? So then he started re, he was like reformulating the way he ran his business and the approach at which he took. And, and now he's in an even stronger position because now he's got a presence online that he never had before because he was scared of it, essentially. Yeah. He was afraid of the technology. And, and our people, people are afraid of using, using cameras and, you know, laptops. They think it's all very complicated. And, and actually, if you set your mind to it, you can do anything. I mean, you know, it, case in proof. You know what I mean? Look at it, case of example. I mean, look at it. Yeah. I mean, you sat down, planned it, decided what you wanted to do, collaborated with a bloody brilliant designer and, um, you know, published your own book. I mean, 10 years, 20 years ago, people couldn't do that. Yeah. And they wouldn't, they wouldn't take the chance. No, and I think, you know, even down to, even if you've got no kind of grand visions to make or do anything, you know, I say to a lot of people, if you're going to get attacked, there's a good likelihood it's going to be in your car or your house. You've never spent more time near your own car in your own house, your own front door, your own stairway, your own garage, your own kitchen. Train in places like that. Get the pads on, you know, if you've got kids, do your mitts in there. You've got, you know, just one mitt to yourself. Do some solo work, do some stuff, practice you know, I even say to people that do like you know, Filipino arts, it's like, well, have you practiced with your own kitchen knives in your kitchen? Because you're not going to run into the garage to your special room where you keep all your fancy knives. Exactly. You break into your house. It's going to be that bread knife, that carving knife. Learn how to use it. Play with it. You know, there's there's so many opportunities to play and train in your own home and your own home environment that you would never have had before. No. Yeah. It's how, many people, true. how many people can honestly say they've ever done any training in their on their own stairs when it's slightly dark? Now you've got the chance. Do it. <laughs> Don't let the time you need it be the first time you've done it. Um, so you know, everywhere is everywhere is a coon, everywhere is a dojo, everywhere is a ring. You, know, you, can, you can practice and do stuff everywhere. And if, if anything, it's more realistic than going to the leisure centre, you know, 20 minutes away and doing it in a nice, well-lit hall. Practice with what you've got. Um, it's highly unlikely you're going to be attacked in a spacious hall with padded mats, you know. Yeah. In your bare feet. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I mean, I've already planned what I'm going to do. If somebody breaks my front door down, I get my sword and I stick it through the letterbox. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> but you know, life's life's too short to. You know, there's nothing you can do about the global pandemic. There are much smarter people working on that particular problem. Absolutely. What you can do is you can look at what you want to achieve and what way can I achieve it? And the, whatever that is, whether it's martial arts stuff whether it's languages, music, connecting with family members, tracing your own ancestry, whatever tickles your pickle, you've got time and opportunity and there's enough free stuff out there to get on your way. You know, it's not even about money. You hear a lot of people say, I can't do this because I don't have the money. You know, I don't have the money to make the fucking book. I crowdsource the book. I don't have any money. Um, it's, it's one of those things where people always say, I don't have time or I don't have money. Well, at the moment, people have got a lot more time and the money you have to find a way. If you've got the time, you can find the money. That's the thing. Yeah. Uh, so for me, lockdown has been good. And I think a lot of people that have come out well from it have been some of the more mentally agile people. If you can apply your thinking, if you were good at one thing, you shouldn't have found it too hard to switch to another way of working or being. Um, I think if you're a little bit static, a little bit rigid before, you know, if you were one of those instructors that were always like, oh, we'll never do online, we'll never do video, we'll never do this, that's stupid. Well, you're being exposed now. I think, I think a lot of them get exposed because a lot of instructors, especially in traditional arts, aren't particularly good at articulation. They're not particularly good speakers. And because of like regimented belt systems, you can rely on your brown belt to teach your green belt, your green belt to teach your white belt. You can just walk up and down and, and hold your own belt and look self-important. And a lot of people have been getting away with that for a very long time. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Don't even get me on training people. Um... You know, when people get black belts, they think they're teachers. Mm, far from it. I mean, you, you, you're probably aware. I mean, I, I used to run a training the trainer course. Once yeah. the guys had got the tenth gun in in Muay Thai, that didn't mean they were instructors. They yeah. had to do the weekend course on communication. I wanted to see them communicate effectively, and 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 share their passion in a way that enthused the the audience. You know, um, 
you know, using using you know techniques from the best communicators in the world, you know. Um, and it's true. It's a really good point you make that going online, working with cameras and technology, it is about uh, you know if you can if you can get your message across online. Once you're back in the gym, you're going to be amazing. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, because um, I've had people say, and I'm sure you've heard it as well, Tommy. Oh, I can't go online. I feel really self-conscious in front of a camera. What in front of not? In, there's nobody there. <laughs> you know, the audience is in your imagination. All you got to do is look through that fucking lens, like as if you're taking your class. That's yeah. it. Um, but it, it 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 is alarming. But I'm I, I'm glad in a way, as you've said, Tommy, that you know it's starting to expose. It exposes the bad communicators in the industry. Absolutely. You know, you need you need to be able to communicate. You need to be able to communicate well. And if you weren't good at that before lockdown. Instructors have had no excuse because there are billions of free guides on public speaking, tone, diction, pedagogy, learning methodologies. You know, even if you are slight, even if you're clueless and you haven't had much in the way of education, that's cool. But there are so many self-improvement things you can just watch and listen to to make you a better speaker, to make your content more clear, to work on your own curricula. You know, I think that a lot of people when they have been exposed, when they can't do it online, it's because they've come up in a, a martial culture where you delegate the responsibility to people below you to do that job. And, you know, I've seen so many people that were really good, you know, green belts, brown belts, black belts, and they pay money to a man and then have to teach his class. Which oh, is frankly, I, said, oh, I wish I'd, I wish I'd jumped on that bandwagon. It would have saved me a lot of problems and less injuries. Yeah, <laughs> it, that always happens naturally in a way, you know, like yeah. you guys have been with you a while, they go around, they know the ropes, they correct people, you know, and that's good, that, that, that should be celebrated. But at the end of the day, if people are paying you money for instruction, instruction is what they get from you. Um, and I think, that's a very, I think it's a very poor leftover element of Asian arts, which has mm. pervaded martial arts on the whole. So that's why I think you get a huge amount of people that quit at Black Belt. Because suddenly they've been asked by their instructor to look after that kids' class on a Sunday. Yeah, well, could you, yeah. you mind doing the Thursday for me and I'll take half the money? That's yeah. right. Yeah. Or how associations split because they're getting all this cash in hand or these direct debits. And then they're going up to their sensei and going, okay, well, there's two thirds of it. Now, you know, anyone that's self employed, you know, when they, when they start to see the money in and if they have to give it else elsewhere, they soon get canny that. Just might as well set up my own bloody club over there at Coxmoor or Paul Green or somewhere else. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, it's been an exciting year for instructors, but I think it's also made instructors have to up their game and become more holistic in what they do and how they speak and work on their own skills. I think it's been a good self-reflection time for instructors. Well, what, what, what I've liked about my group, if you like, it's not a franchise, obviously, it's just a group of guys. When, when I get people up to instruct and they open their own clubs, I don't take a cut. I let them, I, they teach, that's it, great. You, you're an instructor now, spread the word, spread the message. And if they want me to go in to do a seminar, I'll go in and do a seminar for them. But there's no hard and fast rules. But what I've had, which is really nice, is quite a lot of them have come back to me. Obviously, they've seen what I've been doing online and said, um, you need what camera do I need? What, what's the best laptop to get? Do I yeah. need lighting? What's the best microphones? Yeah, it's quite nice because now I'm using me still as a teacher, a communicator to help them communicate that much better using this medium as well. So it does, it does, uh, it does make you think. And it surprises me that the younger instructors are the ones who seem to be falling foul of this, you know. Whereas a lot of the more mature, older, like my sort of generation, are going, right, how do we embrace this? And I think that's because, I don't know whether it's right or not, we have more passion for what we do. Because you wouldn't be doing it this long, for the amount of money we earn, if you didn't love it. <laughs> I think a lot of instructors, you know I mean? they're caught in their own catch-22 as well. A lot of people that really, really slated it as a channel before, to save face now, they can't be like, oh, actually, now I'm going to start running these classes. So I think a lot of people, based on their prior comments, have locked themselves in a Gordian knot of problems. <laughs> they do nothing about it. They've slagged it off so much that suddenly they go, actually, for five ninety nine a week, you can join our Zoom only class. You know, like, they can't say it. They can't do it because no. they've put themselves in their own bear trap, which is very funny. And it's the first time in my fifty uh, odd years of martial arts somebody's used the term Gordian knot. <laughs> in a conversation 
<laughs> uh, for an explanation of the Gordian knot, I suggest you look on YouTube. <laughs> uh, no, but uh, no, it's, it's true. It's, it's fascinating. But let's get back to what you've been doing online. Yeah, right. because I've noticed you've been on Facebook a lot, uh, posting yeah. stuff. How to hit people and <laughs> that's to put, it, to, to put it not too fine a point. That's what we teach, isn't it? How to hit yeah. people, how to deal yeah. with aggression. I, I enjoy how, it. Yeah. Every, every week I make it my business to, to publish some materials. You know, I publish all of my stuff for free. So all of my videos, all of my content, and there is hundreds of hours of it. It's absolutely free. And I don't put any controls on it, any blockers on it. There is no expectation. So for me, I'm just putting it out to the world because to be honest, it helps me keep keep me sane in, yeah. in lockdown. You know, I started doing it for my pupils and for the classes. You know, I moved down from the Midlands, so I thought, well, I'll give people still some stuff to do. And um, eventually I just started to enjoy it because it's it's more for me than anyone else. It allows me to solve a problem. So, you know, I'll start to think of, you know, I, I put a jacket on my bob once and I'm like, oh, I'm gonna do grips, how to grip and move and hit people. You know, I, I, I just pick up things every week. I decide what I'm gonna cover and I do it. Or if I have a spontaneous thought, I'm gonna do it. The process of me figuring out what I'm gonna talk about on camera and show is my training for me. I'm just opening up, basically it's a bit like an open dojo. I'm showing people what I'm doing in my dojo when I've got the time because I enjoy it. And if other people wanna do it, that's cool. And um, yeah, so there's no, I don't, unlike other instructors, I don't really have solid Zoom classes. So I'm not running, you know, every Thursday between X and Y. Mm. Uh, probably about three, four times a week, I'm being asked by other instructors of other arts to go do presentations. So, you know, I've got a couple next week, or a couple the week after. I've had about four last week. Uh, so I'll, I'll go, I'll rock up on a different, you know, and it could be a karate club, a kung fu club, a hemo club. You know, I get in, because I'm relatively open with what I do, I tend to get invited to go to lots of stuff. Yeah. It's not because I'm particularly good, it's because I feel anyway that I'm particularly open. Uh, you know, I, I do it, I'm happy to do it. I think a lot of instructors have probably got to the end of their tether of thinking of content. I like to think I'm a relatively imaginative person so I can think of lots of ways to do things. Right? It's problem solving. Your job as an instructor is to solve problems. So I get asked to do a lot of Zoom classes for other people or Zoom seminars. But for me, I love making my own stuff because it's an expression of me and what I like. Mm -hmm. And in a year's time, I might look back and go, that was a pile of shit. <laughs> this, is, this is what I like now. And I don't have any worries about what I make. So many people are so scared and so precious about what they do. Yeah. And I'm just like, it's cool, it's what I enjoy. Yeah. And I think uh, that, that obviously comes across in the, in the videos that I've watched, you know. And the yeah. other thing, you know, you mentioned the term HEMA. Now, for martial artists, traditional Asian martial artists who might be listening to this, HEMA is historical European martial arts. So by that, we don't just mean sword, because obviously there's pugilism and wrestling involved in that. Um, and I mean, I'm, I'm, uh, you know, as, as you know, Tommy, I'm involved with the Catlan Society, and I've, I've hooked up with a guy called Zane Gray, who's a Highland wrestler. Yeah. And, uh, and we have this online pub once a month where... <laughs> like-minded individuals come on and we talk well essentially some people might call it crap for about two or three hours while drinking voluminous quantities of alcohol you don't have to drink alcohol obviously yeah. me on there uh but zen zen gray was talking about you as well and we, and that we should get you in the pub so we're gonna i'm gonna talk to you about that later privately because <laughs> you'd love that but it's funny isn't it they um because what you've done essentially in, in a way is it's very much a HEMA thing, isn't it? You're, you're going back to not ancient treatises, but older treatises, you know, the, the work yeah. of Fairbairn, for example, which you can, you know, I, I've got a, not a first edition copy, you've got a very old copy of the, the Fairbairn Sykes book on yeah. um, um, uh, Defender, as it yeah. became known. Um, and, and it's all old, old drawings. And, and what you're doing is sort of bringing those manuals, just like the HEMA people do, old manuals like Rollworth and Taylor, the sword stuff and the staff and the halberd stuff, you're bringing it up to the modern day, aren't you? So, yeah. you know, because uh, Fabian wrote a ton of books, really, quite a lot of books. He wrote some All In Fighting, I think, was the name of the book I've got. I think it's yeah. All In Fighting. Uh, he, he did some books on um, for women as well, I believe. He did, yeah. So he you did know, a really uh, fun book. He's done, basically, he's done... Hands uh, Off. It was called yeah. Hands Off. Hands off, I remember, yeah. 
a police self-defense book. So his early work for the Shanghai police. Of course, he's, yeah. he's done a guide for civilians, essentially a civilian self-defense book, but there are still policey elements in it. Yeah. You've got a women's self-defense book. You've got a military self-defense guide, you know, yeah. all in fighting. You've got shooting guides, shoot to live. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. You've got semi kind of half published works, a bit like Tolkien after a man dies. Everything you've, you know, every fag packet you've ever scribbled on suddenly becomes a sellable item. Yeah, you've, of course. You've, and then you've got kind of regionalized reprints. So you've got uh, American versions uh, of, of what Fairburn's done. And you've got lots of, you know, when Bruce Lee died and then you've got like Bruce Lai and Bruce Ling and Bruce Lau. Uh, a bit like that, you've got a lot of guides, especially in America, of what is basically Fairburn's book, but yeah. done by an American somewhere. You know, the, the, there's there's a whole range of really good and really bad Fairburn literature, but it's all cool stuff. It's all interesting stuff. Yeah. Uh, there's definitely a flavour of the period in that, you know, the, the martial arts and combatives as taught between, say, the 30s and the 50s, they've all got a very relatively similar flavour. You know, they're all predominantly judo jiu-jitsu throws and locks with boxing slash Chinese in the main, but there was lots of Japanese too, striking techniques. And they're all kind of blended together. Uh, I think what we've got to remember here is when Fairbairn wrote, wrote those books and was involved in teaching and training, um, he was working in, in a life-threatening environment. It wasn't just like, I'm in a pub doing a door job. You know, he's not like a doorman who's teaching self-protection. He's not like, a karate man who's won loads of competitions. This is a chap who, you know, trained special forces in the Second World War. This shit had to fucking work. And yeah. and and I've because I've, I've I've had people criticise uh, sort of defend who uh, back in the day when I used to write for combat, uh, they they'd say yeah, but I mean the Fairbairn stuff's fucking rubbish, isn't it? And you go, hang on a minute, this guy was teaching operatives <laughs> who were in life threatening situations. He wasn't like teaching somebody just you know Jim from down the road to defend himself against a mugger you know this was like these were people who were putting themselves in a potentially life-threatening situations and if it kicked if they shit hit the fan they had to be able to they had to have some simple simple weapons and I think the simplicity of what Fairbairn was doing is what puts people off I think yeah pe people always find simple threatening you know for for a potted history of Fairbairn for people that don't know so joined as a very young man as a Marine um, and working in embassies and in that circuit from 1900s all the way to 1915. So he's, going, he's got a good period of time as a Marine. Then he goes to join Shanghai police. Um, Shanghai at that time, essentially like the Asian version of Chicago. Mobsters, gangsters, you've got guerrilla communists, you've got kind of drunken European fat cat bastards with bodyguards. You've got drunken sailors coming in from the ports with a sense of authority. You've got a rising also Chinese nationalism. You've got a melting pot of essentially tribes. You've got European interests, Chinese interests. You've got kind of communist Chinese slash Russian interests. You've got a real dangerous city. You've got a vice city of problem. And, and, and Fairburn looking after those international settlements, you know, he, He's looking after essentially the world's first SWAT team. He's introducing riot vans, ballistic shields, one-handed shooting. He's looking at squad tactics. Um, you know, we've got an armory there and they're looking at, right, well, this gun doesn't work in these environments. What about that one or this one or this torch or this knife? You know, this body armor. You know, you've got to think of it almost like a, it's a paramilitary force with the expenditure of empire behind it. So you've got a paramilitary police force in a really dangerous city, and Fairburn is a very hands-on man. And it's a very egalitarian place. It's very open in that you've got Chinese constables, Chinese officers, Indian constables, Indian officers, English, British officers, constables, but also many Europeans, you know, French people, Russians, Americans. You know, it's, it's an international settlement. So he's looking after people of all nations, and they all bring different martial traditions into that pot. Uh, what made Fairburn very good at that time was, um, after a particularly savage beating, he had his bones reset by a jiu-jitsu instructor. Um, so the card that was left on his table was bone setter and jiu-jitsu instructor. 
So Fairburn goes out and, you know, you imagine tensions are rising with Japan at this time. They're both in China, British Empire and Japan. It's a dangerous time. Then there's going to be mutual distrust. And yet Fairburn goes and he gets, you know, gets qualified in jiu-jitsu, gets qualified in judo. No doubt from his years as a Marine and being as a police officer in that settlement, he would have been exposed to boxing, wrestling, savat, fencing, bayonet, pistol shooting, all of the kind of core martial Western disciplines. And very strangely for the time, you know, bear in mind how dimly people viewed China at that time. Yeah. He goes and learns Kung Fu styles as well. So he's learning Bagua or elements of Xing. You know, people, there's not a massively good or clear history of the Chinese arts they learn, but it's very evident in that he makes a point of pointing out his Chinese instructors and many of his techniques are very pointedly Chinese. You know, for a chin jab, for example, it's very clearly claw-like in its fashion, a very Chinese flavor. So, you know, for a man of his time, he's got the practical street experience of running a force in the world's most dangerous city, having already been a military man. And he's got influences, martial influences from all around the world. And he gets to test it every day. And the people he trains get to test it every day. And then when the war happens and he comes over, he can take that knowledge and train essentially SOE agents, commandos, home guard, anyone that needs it with a different flavor. Uh, I think what's important with Defender is that there is no one gutter fighting or all in fighting. What he would have taught or what his instructors would have taught to a one-legged Lithuanian typist whose job is to send things in Morse is going to be very different to what he trains a 19-year-old working-class Glaswegian commander. It's going to be different. It has to be different. So his system has to be simple, readily retained, but the onus, as always, is on the instructor to vary the content for the particular audience. And I think Fairburn and his protégés were very good at modulating and changing what they were doing. It's funny because that fits in with what we were saying earlier on about flexibility in behaviour. Yeah. You know, it's and a good instructor has to have that flexibility. And obviously Fairburn had that in buckets, didn't he? <laughs> yeah, huge, huge amounts of flexibility and a good holistic understanding. You know, even in their basic form, they cover striking, grappling, anti-grappling. They cover weapons. You know, they cover blunt weapons, bladed weapons, firearms. You know, a lot of modern martial arts books, a lot of modern combatives books, don't go anywhere near to that breadth. You know, you can you can buy a, a Krav Maga book, which would be 20 times as long, that would only cover a third of that material. Uh, so, you know, Fairburn, for me, you know, as much as I love the Bartitsu stuff, there's very little record of that. But we have, yeah. what we have with Fairburn is very good record of what he taught, both in film and in writing and in his protégés. Um, but what you've also got is an environment where it is tested, where it is really, really tested. Um, so it's, it's a fantastic art. And you'd be stupid to think that it'd be at a relevancy today because if you think humans have changed morphologically that much in 60, 70 years, then you need to go back to biology. <laughs> we haven't changed in a very long time. No, we get more the same way. And it, he, obviously, uh, he sort of, during the Second World War, he teamed up with Sykes as well, didn't he? Um, so, uh, so Sykes, even, even earlier than that, so even in the Shanghai years. Oh, was Sykes, Sykes around in the yeah. earlier days? Yeah, so oh. Sykes has always been very much the guns man. So whilst right. he also taught the unarmed stuff, Sykes was very much, you know, he was he was the best shot. He, okay. he looked after the guns. That was his particular shtick. Right. You know, they both have mutually interchangeable skills. Fairberg can shoot. Yeah, Sykes can punch. It's all good. But, you know, in their relationship, in their kind of two-man show, Fairburn was more the martial man. Sykes was more point shooting, tactical work, that kind of material. Yeah. And, of course, out of that partnership came the famous FS knife, of course. Which yeah. Is, which now costs a fortune to get your hands on. Costs a fortune to get your hands on originals. You know, they're a brilliant knife. Um but you can also see weaknesses in Fairburn's work. Oh, yeah, yeah, uh, obviously, yeah. One of the great, you know, for example, uh, the if you've seen a Fairburn Sykes knife, it's a long, thin blade. Yeah. And much of the guides are, are about cuts. And even if you sharpen it very well, it cuts like a bag of shit. You know, if, if, you, if I've got a day to teach someone how to use that knife, it's going to be about how many holes can I poke in something nasty. Uh, it's more no. stabbing weapon, isn't it? 
Yeah, it's more, definitely more of a stabbing weapon. Whereas something like a smatch it, like you've got here, which oh, is also yeah. in the guides. Yeah. You know, this, this is a proper front-on fighting knife. Like this, you know, sharp on both edges, wicked point. When you're face-to-face -face with someone, I, I would, you know, 100% I'd rather the smatch it than, yeah. than the Fairburn Sykes uh, yeah. fighting knife. But you know, they're different, different uses. As a sentry elimination tool, perfect. which is in the earliest, perfect. Mm -hmm. Slot in, slot out, nice and simple. Yeah. So while there are gaps in Fairburn, there are some things, I imagine that if he would have lived longer, he would have no, undoubtedly changed his stuff. He doesn't seem to me to be a very proud or vain man in that things he found that didn't work, I think he moved on pretty rapid from, um, which is something a lot of people today can learn from. If they're doing stuff and they don't find it works, don't stick to it, move on like everyone else would. Uh, it's important. You know, so whilst tradition is important, moving on is also important. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Sort of recognize yeah. your tradition, but keep flexible. You know, yeah. it's having that. You know, I've probably said this on the previous podcast. I mean, you have to have an attitude of curiosity, really. That's what it should be about. You know, inquire, question, and 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 obviously, you've got to do it. You know, practically as well. Does this work? Try it out. Use it. And you've got to, you know what I like about your approach to 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 self protection martial arts generally is you know. We'll try it out. You know, you're stuck in a house. Why aren't you training in the house? Yeah. Do it on the stairs in the dark, under the, you know, going into the cupboard, going out in the backyard, you know. You know, going yeah. on your back lane to the shops, think about, you know, what's your environment doing? Switching on your levels of awareness. Because that's got all part and parcel of it, isn't it? Absolutely. You know, I think there are techniques and there are variables. And we spend too much time in techniques and not enough time in variables. And the variables could be the level of lighting, you know, the evenness of the ground. You know, am I in an enclosed space? Am I in an open space? You know, am I slightly injured? Have I got footwear on? Do I not have footwear on? Now, those are variables. We tend to like to collect techniques. What we don't like to do is take the same 15 things and chuck them at a load of variables and see how they change. You know, I think for many arts, they've forgotten the variables and they just teach the stuff and assume that you'll get it. Yeah, and you know, the other variable that's a really big thing is your mindset. <laughs> Yeah. A lot of people are not aware of where they are in their head um, at any given point, and and to recognise the limitations in terms of you know because you you, uh, you know you see people going on knife fighting course and all of this, which teach them to stab people, but you yeah. ask them the question, but you wouldn't do it, would you? And they go, "What? Well, probably not." And go, oh, okay, okay, that's all. Yeah, as long as you realise, you probably won't stab someone if you get the knife off them, you yeah. know. One of my favourite drills to do with people, I call it the evisceration drill. It sounds really wanky in American, but go with me on this. The okay. evisceration drill is this. You imagine someone that's done the worst possible thing to you. The worst possible. You come home, he, I don't know, he's killed your mom, he's eaten your wife, he's wearing your child as a hat. I don't fucking know. It doesn't matter, right? What do you do to that man in your mind at that point of anger? And what, what, what techniques, if you can call them that, what do you do to, to, to destroy at an, an atom level that person? Does that correlate with the stuff that you were doing in the hall yesterday? Mm. Probably not. You know, at the, at, the, at the judo club, at the kickboxing club, at the boxing club, you know, the things you were doing there, you probably wouldn't do to that mortal enemy of a person. So, you know, I think sometimes the thought exercise of what would I do if I needed to be really, really, really bad? Yeah. That's an important journey to take your mind through. And when people say, oh, you know, what techniques do I need to learn? I tell them to do that evisceration drill. And I'm like, do that. Do what you just did. <laughs> you know, it's, you know, whether in your mind it was going to pick up this uh, fucking yeah. bowl, smash his face in it, shard into his face. doesn't matter. But in reality, that's what you would probably need to do. You know, the, the techniques are for fun, fitness, attributes, you know, all that sort of stuff. Great. But if you're thinking pure, visceral, fighting nastiness, things like the evisceration drill are brilliant. Yeah, it's a bit like uh, the evisceration drill. I love it. Yeah, it's a bit like yeah. You know, there's fencing and there's fighting. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> both fencing and it's fun. That's cool, and you can both like, ah, hey, you know, I've moved this way, I've moved that way, and it's experimental. If one of the people just goes like, fuck, odds are he's going to get you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The sword in his life. If he's just going to have at you, yeah, eventually he's going to get you. Well, that's <laughs> uh, why it's often really awful in a a Muay Thai fight, let's say, to fight a novice, because you know you're going to get injured fighting a novice, because they don't know much, but they've got a lot of, like, their fear, 
they're, yeah. the fear kicks in and they just go they go fight like shit on you and you go fuck <laughs> that's what happens. people under duress all they think is right i need to you know fight like shit go like fuck whatever you know whatever your this is why milling is. works in the army you see this is why they use milling in the yeah. in, in the paris yeah. you know you're not allowed to box just fight oh right not like the box no just fight <laughs> <laughs> and that's what Fairburn's got. So Fairburn is notorious, and he, he's quite nice because he has what he called the, the mad half minute. That's just that's the mad half that, minute. That's pleasant, isn't it? That's a pleasant, that's a pleasant degree of milling. Half a like, minute is nothing. But people don't understand how exhausting mm. ten seconds of the best of what you got is. Yeah. Yeah. If you tell someone hit cross as hard as you can, then repeat that for ten seconds. Most people are fucked. They yeah. cannot. You know, even yeah. if you're a very fit. When you're sparring or when you're fighting, it's energy yeah, yeah, you're, 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 you're pacing it, you're pacing it on you. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but that, that milling methodology is something that Fairburn uses. He was one of the first people to come up with kill houses, doing your stuff in realistic environments. Yeah. Yeah. So again, for me, that's my, when I'm at home and it's locked down, my kill house is my house. Mm. If I'm going to get attacked, it'll be my stairway, my door, my garage, uh, my car get familiar in doing stuff, being combative in those environments. Yeah. With sticks, with knives, with my hands, with partners, without partners, whatever I've got. Mm. Yeah. It's applying that. I think Fairburn's stuff is more of a, a mindset than a series of techniques. Yeah. I don't think Fairburn gave a fuck about the techniques, really. Mm. You know, if, if it worked and your mindset was on, that's good. That's all you need. But to me, yeah, and, and people often say this, don't they? But they don't teach it this way. That I've always said, you know, not, it's... 99.9 percent .9 of a fight is mind is, yeah. is is mental you know mental ability it, it's that ability to just suddenly switch on and if you've got the techniques great if you don't have the techniques fine you know but will you you know can you run really fucking fast <laughs> yeah because fear can make you do that you know um so it's it yeah and, and I, I think um you're right i think you're right you know it having a plethora of techniques as opposed to a good solid mindset yeah yeah, I think it's a funny way of teaching, you know. Um, it I mean, is I've hard. Martial, yeah, I've taught martial arts all my life, and uh, a lot of it's for competition, obviously for Muay Thai, which is probably that, from my point of view, certainly it's the, the, the best way to test yourself in terms of physical damage, um, but also teaching self-protection, a completely different thing, completely different thing, different, yeah. different mindset, different mind state. And I've said to some of my guys, you know, when people have said, "Oh God, you're you're fighter," but he's I mean, he must be hard as nails. God, he's not. He's shit scared of a street fight. <laughs> he's brilliant in the ring. He never. He said, "Oh fucking, oh not street violence. No, I don't want to. Oh, no, I'm not interested in that." No, he'd rather just run off, which is fine, of course. You know, yeah. if that's your strategy. Obviously, yeah. Fairbairn wasn't teaching people who had could run away. <laughs> they had to stand yeah. and fight. It was their job. <laughs> and I think one one of the hard things. I think one of the most divisive things is that. People are so entrenched in combatives or self-protection or sporting martial arts. So they don't realize it's the same, it's the yeah. same stuff. You know, 99% of the delivery mechanism of a palm heel mm. is your right cross. It's it, the same it, it's the drill bit at the end. It's whatever you plug in, whether yeah, it's a knife, yeah. your palm, your tickly fingers, whatever you want to do, all of the body mechanics behind it are shared. They're shared property between, you know, I think that's where a lot of combatives people are they, they feel nervous and afraid around self-protection mm -hmm. so around sporting artists i think they find that threatening and scary and they're worried about being exposed yeah it shouldn't be shouldn't be at all um and i think people do need to accept that the sporting arts do get you there faster a lot of the time you take a normal normal lad that's gone to a boxing gym amateur boxing gym three days a week for six months He's going to beat fuck out of most people that's done an art for yeah. five six years. Whether that art is karate, Krav Maga, combatives, traditional, it's just the way it is. It is the way it is. Yeah. yeah. Um, but you know, Fairburn is teaching people. He's taking the best, I think, of sporting disciplines, and he's encouraging people to mill and box, but also add in the nasty combative stuff. There's no reason for it to be so partisan between the two. No. I get a lot of shit. Like making this book has caught me a lot of shit. Yeah. Most of them fat old Americans, fat old Americans that believe they've got some type of living, lasting lineage of this stuff and they own it. It's a load of bollocks, load of bollocks. Um, and Fairburn as a man 
was very, very open to training with other people, you know, going to do and learn new things. Yeah. Can you imagine the sense of cultural shame for a, a police officer in the British Empire to go train with a Chinaman? You know, let's be frank, frank. in the 1930s, yeah, most people wouldn't have been seen dead no. sharing a drink, let alone having someone batty around the head because you're not doing a horse stance properly or not doing a bar meal properly. Yeah. Fairburn was a, an open man, and because he was so open, and he loved the martial arts and he loved combatives. I think that opened doors at times of tension. It opened doors with Chinese people, with Japanese people, with you know people that were in the American legations, the French legations. You know, martial artists tend to like other martial artists, or at least they used to. So doors would open. Whether your countries hated each other or not, the doors would open, the dojos would open, because people can see you're a guy that's into the same stuff, you've got the same hobby. I think that attitude has definitely, definitely changed of late and i think it is becoming increasingly more partisan between oh i'm a combatives person or oh i'm a world war ii combatives person or you know i'm a boxer kickboxer mma guy don't fucking matter it's all it's all the same stuff it's a science of two arms and two legs exactly so just enjoy it you know that that's another one of the problems here don't get yourself so angry online just enjoy it explore it take from it what you will ignore what you don't like and everybody's got different backgrounds, different skills, different things they're training for. So just have fun. Hey, one, one of the things is, I think people always feel like they're under immediate attack. You know, it's like, what can I learn that I can learn in a weekend that will keep me safe forever? Nothing. Nothing is that retainable that you learn it in two days, you remember it forever. So don't worry about it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Just get good. Yeah, get good through practice. And keep, yeah. it simple. keep it simple, stupid as I say. So, I mean, as I said, this book, um, one of the things I said, to, it is a, fair, a very faithful presentation of it. And, and because it's, it's been photographed beautifully, and I, I, I must say, in, in uniform, if people haven't seen it, where did you get that German uniform? So I, I went to a company that uh, essentially serves all the films. So they did the uniforms for Dunkirk. They did it for, what was that um, Christopher Nolan one? Uh, the recent World War Two one ish. Oh, World War Two. Oh. Uh, Dunkirk, Dunkirk, Dunkirk. Oh right, okay. Uh, yeah. So com company did basically do all the movie costumes and that. Yeah. And basically, I rented them, nice and easy. Uh, so you get relatively authentic props. Um, it was great for my mate Chris, who had to get to dress up as a Nazi for the weekend. <laughs> yeah, uh, take him to the pub. He looked too comfortable. He looked too comfortable well, in that clothes. Comfortable for him, he's got like really blonde hair and really blue eyes. Like oh, he's... He, he looks like an Ubermensch. He's look, he looked like he was made in a lab. He looked like he was made for this. <laughs> you, you believe it? The amount of the amount of shit I get, right? Because I've got a beard in the thing. They're like, well, you weren't allowed a beard then. It's like I'm not going to shave my beard off. I like my beard. Right, somebody said that. Yeah, for that level of authenticity, the book. Like, I'm not buying this book. They didn't allow beards. Look. Oh, you're joking! It, it, like, it, 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 I'll be honest. I'll be honest. I never thought. I, I thought, okay, there's a, a British Army putties. They look shit because we had putties in the QLR when I was in the army, and uh, putties are horrible things. And uh, the the rest of the stuff was it nice and itchy? Yeah, it was fucking horrible. Yeah, yeah it was horrible. Great. Um, and I, I genuinely never look. I never saw the beer because I. I think the content's far more important. The uniforms <laughs> are fun, and I think yeah. the setting's nice. It's obviously, you know, an old RAF base or something yeah. like that you photographed it in. So, you know, you've gone to a lot, you've taken a lot of time. The, the whole yeah. thing, the, you know, the whole thing. I, I can't believe somebody's complained about the beer. It's an inaccuracy. You know, I'm filming it in a, a World War I aerodrome. So oh, is that what it was? Right. Yeah. So if, like, if people are getting that caught up, right, I'm not... 80 years old it's not <laughs> the uniforms are from a rental company the yeah. rifle is, is actually made of rubber it's just a really good yeah. prop i uh, thought this was all real oh i, I, people all real. Like, uh, I actually you find that's the 1943 budget like, i don't care it's just, <laughs> it's just cool it's just a cool way to make the book just enjoy the book didn't you think you could have at least gone to shanghai <laughs> I know. Well, to be fair, that what, what am I, that, I? I get that a lot as well. The work in Nazis in Shanghai. I'm like he learned his stuff in Shanghai. It's just a cool name for a book. Let it yeah. go. It's yeah. got good alliteration. Let it go. I'm surprised. <laughs> I'm, but I suppose you always get people who, you know, 
whether it's jealousy, professional jealousy, because they yeah. couldn't be bothered to get off their asses and, and do something like that, or, you know, they're just being pedants, ridiculous, yeah. at, a, at a stupid level. Because, I mean, I, I've, I've, you know, I've got some of the old Fairbairn books and, you know, I've looked at them and I've seen the little draw and the draw the drawings are really cute and nice. And there's a Nazi getting strangled from behind, getting stomped on, somebody being stabbed in the back, and it's all good fun. And you know what exactly what he means by it. But what you've done is you've got those 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 manuals, if you like, and you've just brought them up to date. Yeah. Uh, in a in a I think a really nice way. I mean, so if, if people are confused... Despite the beard. Despite yeah. the beard. <laughs> the, the main gist of the book is I've aggregated most of Fairburn's published works. So yeah. from his Shanghai policeman years up until the war years. Uh -huh. So normally they're separate volumes. And I've yeah. smushed those techniques together. What I've then done is added more detail because most of the books, especially the wartime books, are by necessity Spartan. They're written in a very sparse way because you don't have the paper of the airtime. No, of course not. Whereas no. I've got all the paper in the airtime, so I can talk about making sure that you use your hip into that palm hill to make sure that your chin's tucked when people are grabbing you in case they nut you. you know, I've got space and time to elaborate more, to make the techniques hopefully safer and better for people yeah. and more enjoyable, because you know much of Fairburn's work really, is in its original form, you need someone that knows what they're doing mm. to tell you what to do. You know? It gives you the bare necessities, you edge of hand blow, shop. But unless someone tells you how to use your shoulders with that, your hip with it, your foot with it, how to do it when the opponent's on one knee, taller than you, from the side, this Fairburn doesn't touch any of that stuff no. because he's relying on an instructor to, to show That's something. Right. Like yeah, that. it's the same, it's the same with the old sword manuals, isn't it? Yeah. People are constantly interpreting the sword manuals in different ways because the information was there for an instructor who already knew how to do it. As an aid, it was an aid memoir. Yeah. You know, it's it, just an aid memoir. Exactly. Uh, well, it adds more than that. And then I add some different stuff in there. So I expand a little bit more about traditional jiu-jitsu. Yeah. Fairbairn trains in traditional jiu-jitsu. So here's some atemiwaza, different striking techniques. Yeah. And boxing and extra elements on the weapons from other people of the time. So again, it brings together the aggregated volumes of his stuff stuff from other peers and writers of the period you know for example you've got huge body of work you've got aurology yeah. so this is another world war ii guide written you know essentially giving mad celtic slash welsh names to techniques you know the welsh death lock you know some of this stuff is is, is you know, some of it's good some of it's awful same with fairburn same with everyone you know, fairburn nicked a good load of his stuff from world war one books like yeah, fighting yeah. Dead, you know Everybody nicks each other's stuff. Hand-to-hand mm. -hand combat from World War One. Yeah, like, there are hundreds and hundreds of these guides, yeah. so you can't get too het up about it. My, my, with this book, I felt like my main job was to aggregate what I felt was good and true to the spirit of the man and what he taught, mm. and package that and give it back to people to play with and experiment with, and hopefully they enjoy it. Uh, I think most people that have read it have enjoyed it, so that's cool. Yeah. Um, and if not, you can at least beat an intruder to death with it. Oh, it's a big God, yeah. Problem. I mean, this would serve as a weapon just in its own right. I mean, yeah. Um, it's the heaviest book I've had around on martial arts for a while. And that, and that, I mean, talking about the quality of the paper as well. You know, you're not, you're not buying shit paper. This is good quality paper with beautiful design. So, I, I like the book. You know, I always imagine when I'm an old man and I've got grandkids around the fire, yeah. will I be able to find a DVD or a white labeled Netflix video service. You know, all the things that we sign up to now will not exist in five, six year time. In the same way that people that used to be on the old Yahoo groups and messages and forums, yeah, their, right. their content would be around forever. And yeah. it's not. So for me, as much as those platforms are accessible and cool, and that's why I make videos, yeah. in reality, having a proper book, it's not gonna go anywhere unless I burn it, drown it. Or, oh, yeah. Oops, oops. Yeah. I, I, I don't, the Kindle thing is great and it's handy, but you, I'll always have those and they'll, they'll be passed on, you know. Yeah, yeah, and, and I love the idea. Web paper. And there's, yeah. something, there's something very visceral about handling a book as well, you know, just you know, touch it. And I mean, you know, when you open this, this is what it was like when I picked your book up, and, I, and this is no bullshit, right? And I, I'm quite tactile, and I, I picked it up. It's like, you know, when you get an iPhone for the first time. 
that's all it needed. If it was in a lovely box with, <laughs> but seriously, it's that sort of like, ooh, yeah, this is a book you like, and you'd be careful with. You'd sort yeah. of treasure it. You know, it's not like a shitty little pamphlet or manual. And that I've had a couple of people laugh that I've uh, I've, I've put tea stains in the book in advance of people putting their cup on it. Oh, I like yeah. that. I thought that was a really nice touch. <laughs> and, and obviously the little stamps as well, you know, the, the like passport stamp type things. Yeah, uh, just for people, you know, people need experience reads now. It, it's no longer good to just be a book. You know, no. that that book needs to compete with a website or a film. Exactly. So the need to be big and lucid. The yeah. instructions need to be clear, and the book needs to be kind of categorised and, and laid out for for people. You know, I apply. You know, I used to be a teacher. My yeah. job is to apply my teaching brain to that book, and and that's what I did. You know, I took it, split it out try to make it easy for people to follow and pick up and play. And my hope is that people will pick up a book like that and say, fuck it, I might have a go at putting some of that in my club, in my class. I might want to start my own yeah, Fairburn or World War II style about it. That's cool. Yeah, and for those who've never heard of Fairburn, it's it like opens a new world for them because they'll, if, if, if I was in a position where I'd never heard of Fairburn and I, this book landed on my desk and I thought, oh, I'll be rude of this. I read it and go, right, I want to find out more about this Fairbairn guy. Yeah. And, and then you just go and find all the old sources, which is yeah. great because it, it keeps that. And then in a sense, it's part of the lineage, isn't it, of a yeah. type? You know? And there, there is no way in hell that, you know, a 20-year-old today is going to pick up all in fighting, average 20 year going to look at that and be in any way massively enthused. Not at all. There wouldn't be impressed with people. You know, right. yeah. It's okay when you're as old as me because books were written on you know papyrus and stuff when i was a boy <laughs> it means about keeping it alive there are a lot yeah. of people in you know in in hema and I, I would class a lot of the world war ii stuff as a hema really yeah, there's a lot yeah, of people of that, that want to keep that very small and very niche these this is my club these yeah. are my members these are the people i approve of these are the people yeah. i don't approve of you know i think if you really love your art you are a big proselytizer in that art. You will go to people. Second niche word of the, the discussion. You will yeah, go. Oh, you'll preach, yeah, you preach the good word of it. You'll be like, "This is cool. Come join it." Every art that's mainstream today is around because someone proselytized. Because you know, Kano from Judo was like, "This is really cool. It's great for kids. It's safe. It's effective. I battered all those jujitsu guys. It's cool. Come in to the dojo." You know, every art that's flourished has flourished because they've had a big come in personality. Karate, again, that had a big boom because karate for a good period of time was very open to people. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I think lots of the Chinese arts, you know, many of the parts of the Chinese arts, are say, aside from say Tai Chi and Wing Chun, mm -hmm. a lot of them have diminished because they've not had that open attitude. Absolutely yeah. not, no. No, you're not, you don't get many Honga practitioners, for example. No. Five animal yeah. style, you know, you don't even hear about it. And you mentioned some early on Xing Yi, for example. Who teaches Xing Yi? Who even yeah. knows what Xing Yi is? And Bagua. You know, people yeah. go, Tai Chi, Bagua, Xing Yi. What? Yeah. What, what? What's the other two? I've heard of Tai Chi. Oh, yeah, because yeah, somebody sold it as a product. But Xing Yi, yeah. I love Xing Yi. You just don't find it anywhere. Uh, you, I, you've I, got to be I, excited I, by it. You know, all the best people. Master Skin coming to Manchester, you know, teaching Thai boxing. Big shows, flyer drops, books, videos, talks. You've, you've, you've got to put it out there for people to enjoy. Otherwise, you and your little circle doing your little thing will one day not be there. And yeah. all the great knowledge that that little circle might have had, it's gone forever. Yeah. yeah. And it's funny, you know, the, um, the Catron Society get quite a bit of stick from some of the HEMA, I think, uh, because they, work, they teach online. Yeah. And, and of course, the Catron Society is getting huge now. Because everybody's online, yeah. <laughs> and the cat and Heiko, who's the president, was I was talking to him the other day, and he was saying, "I can't believe the numbers of people that are coming in now." And it's of course it's all free as well. Of course, the cat run society nobody charges. It's a labour of love. And when Chris Cock Thompson was the first person to sort of put together all of the different works of Page, of Rawworth, of Taylor, you know, of McGregor, he put them all together in one book. How brilliant was that? And yet people went, oh, that's wrong. You shouldn't do that. What? He's just made it accessible to a whole new audience. And you're going to have a whole new group of people putting their heads together and thinking, hang on, do the treat? Can we do it like this? Can we do it like 
wow, maybe that's what they did. Because obviously yeah. back, particularly in the 17th and 18th century, we don't really know how they did it. We've just got some basic pamphlets, like Fairbairn's, you've got some basic pamphlets that show you some pictures and tell you a few moves. Yeah. Uh, Chris has done the same with with, uh, with the Scottish Broad, so that you, you know, I'm saying what that you've done with, with Fairbairn. Yeah. It's about, let's make it accessible, let people see see it for what it is, and actually practice it. Bloody hell, you're keeping the thing alive. How amazing is that? I mean, yeah. <laughs> otherwise it'll just die. It would it'll be gone. So okay. if anybody out there doesn't like this sort of stuff, they shouldn't be listening to this podcast, to be honest. Exactly. <laughs> one of the great things about being a relatively young man in this game is that I can say, well, you can fight me or fuck off. If you really don't like it, you, you can come down to any number of Essex gyms and we can fight about it and you'll probably oh, I've said that so many times. If you don't like what I've seen, come and see me. You know yeah. where I am about the gym. Nobody's yeah. ever come. <laughs> the gym, you're probably going to die of diabetes before you even get to me. <laughs> <laughs> and on that note, right. Now, look, um, we've done well over the hour now. Um, and it's been brilliant, as usual, Tommy. Um, have you got any other plans? So, my plan is, I've done the Bartitsu book. I've yeah. done the Defender of the World War II book. Yeah. My plan will be to do one book, which is basically the stuff that I find interesting. Oh, so, okay. so whilst the two books have been historical and have had, you know, still it's stuff that I find interesting. I'm unashamed in saying that. It's the bits that I like and I think work and I enjoy. Yeah. Those two books at a historical place. I wanted to do something that's a bit more current, a bit more contemporary, okay. and to factor in environments and situations that are likely today. Okay. Um, but my plan is to go rather big with it. So you, you know I work in advertising. Yeah. So my plan, I want to do some stuff. Trains, planes, buses, cars, nightclubs. It's those types of venues or locations where I want to show these are some interesting things you can do to stay safe in police, places like that. Okay. So, so my next book will be more modern, self-defense, self-protection. But for me, it'd be more about the variables than the techniques. You know, people can see the techniques I like in the previous two books. Cool. The next one will be about, you know, how do you work it in low light? How do you work it in cramped conditions? How do you work it when the ground is an absolute joke? You know, how does it work in these types of places? So for me, probably my trilogy of books will be the Bartitsu of late 1800s, World War II combatives, and modern self-defense, self-protection. and I will be able to throw everything I like into that. I've tried to keep true to the spirit of Bartitsu and Defendu and use things, even if it's not from the men, from the peers of the men. So of the same time, the same period, I've tried to do that as far as I can. With the next book, I've essentially got a completely open book because it's, you'll have a better title, it'll be Cool Stuff That Tommy Likes. And if you like these other two things, you'll probably like this one too. That'll be the, that'll be the shtick, I should imagine. Brilliant. And of course, it'll be beautifully presented. As always, well. <laughs> absolutely. Well, you can't not do it like that. And I, I like, I like. I mean, I think the point you made earlier on uh, about you know, modern the modern youth of today, young people today, expect a lot more than just a book with a few pictures in. This is a book and a bit more. Yeah, the way you design it, it is. It's like a a printed version of the of a film, if you like, and a YouTube channel or something, which is perfect. Well. Um, if I ever use it in physical combat, well, one day when I'm in the queue waiting for my pension, I'll let you know. <laughs> but, um, we'll have to, we'll have to get you on again, obviously. Um, uh, you know, we'll keep in touch about yeah. you know your future developments. And um, it's been brilliant, Tommy, as usual. Oh, thank you, Benny. And uh, proselytize, and of course, Gordian knot are two new words that some of my listeners may have heard for the first time and you heard it here <laughs> <laughs> and with that i'll bid you a good night tommy and thanks very much mate brilliant stay, stay safe brilliant. Carl. thanks mate bye bye bye